Hello, welcome to my podcast. I'm your host, Larry Liu, and today I'm joined by Mike Bull. Uh, welcome, Mike, to the podcast. Thanks, Larry. Awesome. Uh, so, yeah, let's go right in. I mean, uh, the, the big topic of today would be um, the technological change uh, again. So uh, it's called Chat GPT, uh, which is uh, a very interesting AI um instrument that i have not used myself but i've uh, watched uh, uh, video summaries of it uh and the idea is that you can take um a short prompt right like for instance uh i don't know write uh, a 10 page essay uh on you know hamlet's culpability in shakespeare or something like that right uh and then uh and then it would write the 10 page essay in i want to say probably a couple of seconds right i mean it takes some it takes a little bit of time to uh crunch that well to process that information uh and then to form coherent sentences um and uh, i was also also reading about some of the uh, glitches that um the system has um though none of it sounds fatal like for instance they were saying that or like historical information actually uh it's not as good right because they fed a lot of data from after 2021 when they started experimenting with it uh but that that sort of data issue i think can be fixated by um you know, just add feeding more information, more data into it. Um, and um, in terms of the overall quality, um, so you've, you're familiar with the Turing test, right? Um, yeah. Which is um, yeah, developed by a guy named Alan Turing. Um, and he says that if uh, a human write something um and, or or it could be a computer who's writing something uh and then if you read it and you cannot distinguish whether it was a human uh or a computer that that wrote the text uh then you pass the Turing test right um so then um and i th and i believe that a lot of people that have tried to use this chat GPT, um, they have said that it would pass the Turing test. Um, yeah. And um, so we have like a few applications um, of industries that could be impacted by uh, chat GPT. So the one is writing professions and the other is the education system. So the the, the, the writers' uh, occupations, so we're talking, you know, it could be our scholars, it could be journalists, um, it could be, um, yeah, travel writers or something. Um, uh, novelists, right? Any, novelists. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they would be very concerned uh, about um, I mean, if effectively, I mean, imagine if you have a proliferation of novels and written texts and newspaper articles, um, essentially of curious private individuals, right, who basically, you know, give these prompts to chat GPT. And then those amateurs publish those pieces which are fairly good quality. Yeah. And the question is, what is going to be your added value as a professional writer, as somebody who sits down and writes the text beginning to the end yourself? Um, and then the second application, I mean, I received an email from the university administration regarding the use of chat GPT. Um, uh, effectively, the concern is that 
take home assignments, essays, take home exams um, could all be uh, written by chat GPT instead of uh, by the students themselves. Um, the real risk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I spoke with a professor recently, uh, an engineer, and he was convinced that there will be a resurgence of oral exams. Um, yeah, because the, I, I guess the idea is that um, the, that this would be one of the only ways how you could not cheat, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I mean that, that's 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 quite an interesting idea. But anyway, I've I've gone on for a little while, so oh, that's good. Um, uh, like you, uh, I'm also just you know kind of learning. I'm in learning mode, learning process. Uh, I, I follow several teaching, uh, resource websites, uh, teaching sociology, you know, and they've actually mentioned this. And, and one of the, one of the strategies that they have tried to suggest to maneuver in this new world of, you know, uh, chat GPT, uh, is, uh, you know, there's several options. Uh, some people think you can accommodate, you may even encourage the use of it. Others want to just straight out ban it. Uh, others want to redo their assignments, like you said, and and require something more actual person uh, doing something experiential learning. Uh, in my case, uh, I, I will probably redesign several of my major assignments and it will look for originality, you know, and... Uh, uh so that's 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 going to be a, a difficult thing i think for us academics to ensure that we know that the people that are writing it are actually our students you know um but like anything else i mean we've kind of faced this already with uh the uh, essay websites that pop up you know the last few years and ed for higher editors and so it's not something new we've we've dealt with this but now this will take it to the next level you know because it, it'd be more difficult to trace uh this sort of program when it's used right so so yeah it'll be a real challenge but like i'm sure like you i mean i i follow all the tips from my colleagues and what we could do to try to minimize uh you know the duplication or... how, how would you stress originality i mean could you give an example <clears throat> uh, probably voice uh i'm not sure how advanced uh i heard i heard that it, it it is perhaps the way you design your actual assignments you make it very specific and and narrow it to where it's not something broad more like definitional you know and you give specific requirements that required that fulfillment of that assignment. So let me give you an example. Uh, I have one assignment in my class where uh, they construct childhood memories of themselves, right? And it, it's not something that you can just grab. I mean, you could technically have someone else that has their childhood memories, but then they have to kind of use like a photo essay and then they apply sociological concepts. Now there, there's a risk. I mean, you could actually, uh, uh, that that would be a risk with the concepts itself. That's one, uh, you know, uh, thing. But when you re have specific requirements, you might be able to, you know, filter those that may just be writing or plagiarizing or just taking it from this program. So you have more specific requirements. You know, that requires something else besides just writing. It could be format. It could be uh, a, a photo essay kind of like thing or or uh, uh, YouTube video itself where the person is visible. Now, the only problem there is that somebody may read it off a script, you know. So, right. Uh, some people require, like you said, oral presentation is a big thing now. Experiential learning. Uh, uh things like that where you can trace what they did at what time or what what are they doing or what what uh, resources are they using i definitely would you know require references for everything they use i mean powerpoint slides to online sources 
uh, to journal article sources, like everything would have to be referenced. And that might that might help because then you have to reference it. You know. Yeah, but that's what uh, GPT, yeah. GPT doesn't do at the moment. Um, yeah, at the now moment, you yeah. now you could, I mean, as a chat yeah. GPT developer, you know, you could add, you know, referencing. Um, especially like if you put into the prompt that it was going to be an academic text. Yeah. Um, then I think then, you know, citations would probably be automatically added. Um, the other thing which besides oral exam, I would say is, um, you could do written exams, um, like in person, <laughs> in, in person, okay. written exams, pencil paper, right? So okay. it's about deciphering, you know, the ugly handwriting of the students. Um, because, because the issue also, yeah. like, if you have the computer thing that's going on, right, you know, it's just going to be like a window. And then on the other window, you're going to have your Google, right? Your Google yeah. search, uh, which will give the answer. Or Alexa, Alexa, Alexa. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what about a portfolio like requirement? Like I thought about, uh, you know, as a teacher that uh, in case of requiring a, a portfolio, sort of including your notes, including anything you've written, including, uh, you know, I know it'd be a paper trail, but uh, portfolios might be more difficult. I mean, you could eventually all print it out and then you submit it to an instructor. But I think if you uh, have required, you know, the note taking itself, I don't know if that's still a thing or uh, uh, the outline, maybe a pro uh, I know that some instructors that teach English are saying they require an outline before the, the final product is submitted. So if you require uh, outlines, so then uh, of course, they can still cheat, I guess, is training an outline, but you'd have to have an outline before you could write uh, or present the whole essay so or submit the essay. And and maybe limiting the, you know, the, the, the materials that can be used. Maybe you assign four and those four, only four sources can be used. Uh, for university, I guess that might be more challenging. Isn't it? But like limiting the amount of sources? Yeah, like you would only assign the sources that they uh, should use. Uh, it may be yeah, the I, are... I'm, ag I'm against that because yeah. okay, um, yeah, <laughs> my, because my idea of a university education um, is supposed to be expansive, right? Expanding your own yeah. mind, and the students are on their own trajectory, on their own learning trajectory, and it's different for everybody because everybody has slightly different interests. And if you say, okay, well, you can only cite the sources that are mentioned in the syllabus, mm. then, you know, it just means that regurgitate the same stuff that I just yeah. taught you, which to me sounds like a very bad model of education. It's um, there. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like the banking model of education, according to Paulo Freire, right? Um, and um, I, I, it's, I, I... Yeah, I admit, I mean, it's authoritarian. Uh uh, but I don't know, like, like, oh, you know, another issue, another thing is if they have software to get, to detect it, then, then maybe then we don't have to worry about it, you know, as educators, you know, if there's ways that there's counter software or something, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I, I so, okay. So here's my take. I, I, I yeah. think that the issue of fraud detection, right. Um, is a battle that the instructor cannot win. Um, I, I think that the uh, computer technology is quite advanced. Um, many of us, you know, within the higher education industry, we're not as technically versatile. I mean, there might be some who are, but most people are not. Um, and we're not going to become, you know, advanced AI researchers ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and even many of the AI researchers themselves are confused about the overall trend in AI because they're only working in a specific domain within the whole industry, right? The whole industry 
consists of a lot of different domains. Um, so he, here's what I would tell my students. So because I give them a take-home exam, which you know that it could be cheated technically, is I would simply tell them. And I would be honest with them. I would say to them, like, there's no way how I can, you know, trace back whether, you, you know, you use the, the, the chat GBT or whether you wrote it yourself. Um, you know, all I can ask you of is, why are you attending this course, right? So the, there must have been something that sparked your initial interest in this course. And... And I want you to use the course as a way of this discovery, like your way of discovering the topic uh, on your own terms. And if you let a computer do it for you, I mean, you are effectively blocking yourself from that experience. Right? Well, yeah. Yeah. For, for me, it's, it's important to say that it's not that taking a course. It should never be about the instructor, which unfortunately the GPA system, the grading system makes it seem like, you know, taking a course is about pleasing the teacher. Um, I, I, I think the objective of taking a course going to college is discovery um, uh, on your own trajectory. Um, and, um, and I would just tell them like, do you want to rob yourself of that experience? I mean, it, it, it's 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 a question that like actually every student in the heart they will have to reply to that with a yes or a no. I mean, like they don't have to tell me, you know, to my face, you know, what what their answer is. I mean, because there might be a social desirability bias uh, in that, uh, which is a survey term, I guess. Um, like you know, not not wanting to say things that uh, sound um, against the mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and so there's another thing about ChatGPT which I found particularly interesting. Um, it, it it also involves coding, um, and that means different things. So it could mean. Um, because you know, in coding, there's so many languages, right? You got the C plus plus, you got JavaScript, um, you got, um, and then within the statistical software, you got R, you have Stata, you have um, Python. Um, Python is probably the most universal one um, uh, because it does statistical so software analysis as well as uh, you know, computer programming, um, and and sometimes, like if when you work on projects, like you work with other people who use code from a different language, right? Mm -hmm. So then, oftentimes you have to spend time translating it. And now, apparently, with the Chat GPT and other similar AI systems that are around, uh, you can actually um, do a full translation of computer code. Uh, oh, wow. So between the different uh, computer languages. And then the other thing, and then the other thing is writing code from scratch, right? It's about where you basically have set instructions. Um, you type those instructions in. Um, you feed in the data set, um, and then it will, you know, clean the data for you. It will spit out an analysis for you. Um, now, I, I mean, obviously, like social scientists, I mean, I'd be very curious to see, okay, well, you know, does it really work? I mean, I haven't tried that. Um, but, 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 but if, but if it works, um, and it cuts down the amount of time to perform, uh, you know, statistical data analysis. Good question, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah, it could, it could, it could inflate the um, the count of of articles published for sure. I mean, and that 
I don't know whether it's, that's a good thing, but but anyway, so but but for coding, um, you remember, part of the new liberal paradigm, uh, is learn to code. I think that's one of the, um, you know, stories that we tell young people, uh, and of course, you know, we sociologists are, you know, don't like to hear that because, um. Uh, because it, the, the the underhanded suggestion is always to scrap the humanities and uh, social sciences, uh, and then just go straight for yeah, yeah, computer programming and machine learning and so forth. Um, but if you can really ease the way of doing coding. I mean, okay, they, okay. So people who want to be coders, I mean, it still requires a particular skill, right? Um, namely, the skill of knowing what to input into the Chat GPT, right? Like you actually, you have to know enough of like machine learning, statistical theory, or math theory, or whatever, to know what you input into that um, uh, AI software in order to get the desired results, right? So that, that, I think that's a skill that, you know, not every Tom, Dick, and Harry on the street could do, right? Yeah. Um, but beyond that, like the actual grunt work, so to speak, of coding, like from the first line to the, to the last um, um, to produce that result, um, that skill that 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 people are spending lots of time on to affect um, might no longer be necessary very soon. Um, so reduction of labor time, right? <laughs> yeah, a reduction of labor time. So, so that's why I think. See, I think the biggest question in AI now. So, this is coming from somebody who doesn't study AI from the you know um, computer science engineering perspective uh, I believe is ethics is philosophy I think that's the that's the key component namely the question that arises simply is what is is the goal what's the point of being a human being What's the point of being alive? I think it really goes down to this essential question. Hmm. Because at the point where the st or students are no longer writing their own essays, uh, at the point where you know scholars are no longer really writing their own papers, I mean, they still, of course, select the topics that they want to you know find the answer to, but it's going to be. I mean, I'm saying it very exaggerated and facetiously, but it's going to be like a Google search. I mean, imagine a scholarship, doing scholarship would be as um, mentally uh, straining as a Google search, which is not at all. Um, then what is the value of, say, being a student? What's the value of being a you know, a scholar, um, and broadly, I think you know, uh, if 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 it hits um, all of the knowledge-based occupations uh, that make up um, a chunk of our labor force, maybe less than twenty percent for sure. But um, yeah, well, what 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 does that mean for for, for that group of people, effectively, and? Um, those jobs uh, disappearing and the consequences of those jobs disappearing, right? Yeah, the, I, th I believe the commercial implications are, I, I, I think they are pretty obvious, right? So the, the job disappearance, as you mentioned, um, you know, if, if there's one company that does it and then the other ones are like, no, 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 we're going to keep on the labor costs. You know, we're going to keep on the staff. We value human input and so on and so forth. 
Um, and I, I, th- I, th- I think in some areas this will still remain true. Um, and I would say it will remain true in in what we might call boutique services. Mm-hmm. So elite services. So we t- so just give an example. Um, like let's say if if you and I, you know, like live in different countries, we speak different languages. You know, we meet each other in a bar, in a pub, or something, right? Um, you know, and let's say we don't speak each other's language, right? So we could probably communicate just fine with Google Translate, yeah, right? Probably, because yeah. Go- because it allows because if you have it on your phone, right, it allows you to speak, and then it does, and then it translates, and then vice versa, right? So we could probably have a conversation on that basis. Um, so for that, for sure, I mean, no translators um, required. Uh, now, but then, however, if you think about like like government officials, right, heads of state, like they still hire translators. I mean, even though you know, I think AI is probably just as good, if, if not better, than the human translators. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but you're, you're not gonna, they're not gonna displace the human translators for. You know, for heads of state, for instance, right? And philosophically, would you say that it's because people still see the social value of labor itself and people uh, having value that it goes back to, uh, you know, we as a society also kind of decide and determine when something is socially necessary and has social value. I mean, uh, I was always puzzled, you know, when you think about sports, entertainment, comedy, you know, actors, poets, uh, we like to say they all have value, you know, but it seems uh, in the marketplace that often fluctuates really quickly. But we can look at it from a historical perspective, you know, that the social values change and with this new technology now that we're talking about that again we'll see a shift a reinterpretation of what is socially necessary labor and what is social value you know like value of occupations value of uh uh, originality authenticity you know that people create their own art after all this is not just in the arena of written text now they have AI, ai art and a lot of artists are worried that it's so easy to duplicate and mass produce, you know, <laughs> artificial art uh, using these uh, AI technologies. So again, it raises this old philosophical, I guess, sociological question of socially necessary labor and social value of labor. Like I think that's what we're getting at, you know, and uh, and they look at it through a historical perspective. I mean. There are some labor tasks uh, that are obsolete now, you know, or that are not seen as socially uh, valuable labor. Uh, And then there's a change of thought, you know, what is uh, valuable or what is seen as necessary in society? Do we need certain kinds of jobs? Like you said, uh, a translator as a person, individual representing government, you know, do you really want someone to use Google Translate? (laughs) No, that's why we have government officials, right? Real positions that give value and meaning. And those people occupy it. People occupy it, not pods or robots. You know? That's the way I would go in that direction, I guess. Well, I, I, I did have a discussion uh, yeah. with a friend who is who is a computer scientist. So uh, he's very favorable to technical solutions to everything. and um, And he's in favor of you know, AI government. Um, wow. So, because I must say, because he grew up in a developing country, so uh, he's very concerned about corruption, like leakage uh, from corrupt officials. Um, and it's probably true, like, you, you, you could design, you know, AI civil servants to, you know, not be corrupt, right? I mean, it's also a question of like, you know, what does a computer want, right? I mean, because I mean, uh, like a government official, like a human, is corrupt because, you know, he wants to buy status goods, 
to show off uh, in front of his family and friends and so forth, right? To have influence and power. Um, I'm not sure whether you would want to program that into, you know, computers and algorithms. I mean, what would, you know, what would be their point of making money, right? They wouldn't have these human motivations. Um, so, um, so I think from that vantage point, it, it made sense for him to argue that, you know, AI government is a good idea. Um, I, I, I would find it questionable, however, because be, because you don't know whether Big Brother is going to be good, right? So, I mean, ultimately, like you know, and you're going back to this 1984 uh, George Orwell uh, scenario, um, where yeah, the, where Big Brother becomes a surveillance state becomes oppressive and there is nobody able to overrule that AI government because by definition I mean the government is the lawmaker right mm -hmm. the, 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 the lawmaker makes the law of society so in that sense I mean y yes there's a risk of a human being corrupt Right or doing crazy things. I mean, you know, look at Putin, right? Um, but that, but 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 that's still it, it's still a calculated risk. I think that that we can take um, compared to the what what AI government would do um, if it wasn't doing the things to our liking. Um, so I go back to this this Weberian, you know, Reality. iron cage. Okay, iron cage. The the iron cage argument, um, where basically he says that, you know, the the you know, there's a cloak of the Protestant work ethic and burning fossil fuel and you know, uh, you know producing more and more goods and services, capitalism and an endless cycle. Um, but then if you have capitalism in an endless cycle, then you know, you have to think, make things countable, right? You have to rationalize things, mm -hmm. uh, and by, by rationalize, he means um, making things calculable, like numbers. Like you, 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 you basically set up numbers as a target, and then you, and then you do everything to meet those targets, right? Um, you know, think yeah. of like I don't know number of courses you have to teach, number of publications to get tenure, and all these things, right? So, um, so it's it's and and in a world of AI governments, you know, the AI system would have to be programmed based on numeric metrics, mm -hmm. right? Because because otherwise the AI wouldn't know what to do, right? Like there really would just be laissez faire, no action at all, right? I mean, so presumably you would have to program it um in the pursuit of some metric, right? And then the question is, well, okay, well, what's the metric that you're using? And if we don't like the metric, or if the metric that you're pursuing makes us neglect another metric, yeah. um, then how do we adjust it? And I'm very worried that like when you get to the point of giving Metrics. AI the lawmaking ability that you're not able to reverse it, right? Yeah. You know, uh, I was just uh, thinking of a book I read, The Metric Society. I was looking at my bookshelf over here. I think, let me, give me a second. I think I may have it up here. Yeah, here it is. This, uh, I think I may have showed you this before, Stefan Mao. And he basically uh, makes the same argument that uh, you're making. I mean, Weberian, you know, uh, view of the success, excessive view of turning everything into a metric form and how our modern societies is almost obsessed with it. I mean, we, we try to measure our daily footsteps, you know, we, we do rankings, uh, index publications in academia on metrics, you know, uh, and everything is in a metric form, you know, and so the question is, uh, 
is that supposed to replace social value or uh, other interests like uh, aesthetic value, you know? Um, and uh, I guess the core argument he was making in this book, the way I was reading it, is that that turns very totalitarian-like, you know? It's everything is based on numbers, <laughs> you know? We're trying to create a metric society, you know? Right. Everything is on metrics. And like you said, I mean, it's uh, concerning because uh, then we leave out all the other things that also still have significant value, aesthetics, you know, uh, empathy uh, is another, right? Uh, originality, authenticity, I would say, and uh, humanity, right? So, yeah, I mean, that's, but there's benefits, don't get me wrong, there's benefits to accountability and systems that are uh, based on uh, 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 like a fast food place when you go inside you know it's it's predictable it's uniform you know it's a real system that produces products and it has consumers waiting in line and it can pretty much make it to where it's very profitable and everybody likes mcdonald's you know <laughs> or fast food um but imagine if we started turning all of our institutions into little McDonald's, right? I think that's Richard's thesis. Yeah, that, that is what's happening yeah. anyway. So, I mean, I had yeah. a discussion this morning with an engineer um, who uh, was talking about um, the commercial pressures of architecture um, uh, because so because so there's a there's a value conflict between the funders of architecture uh which are usually you know big banks big corporations government etc um and the architects themselves so the architects they are creative types uh so they have all kinds of weird and you know crazy and artistic ideas about how to um design a building um and the funders, however, they have a very strict uh, and conservative way of, um, you know, de designing a building, um, because, well, I guess it, it, so. Two things. So, so first, they they only want to produce the outcome, right? Yeah. So, for instance, if you are an architect for a hospital. Right then, the funders they care more about, uh, I don't know, the medical equipment inside of it, that then produces I don't know surgeries for patients, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so so they think more in in those terms rather than, you know, the hospital Function. looking beautiful, right? Yeah. yeah. Um. Uh. So there's a sort of functionality, um, as opposed to, um. You know, art. Um, and then the other element is cost, right? Definitely, yeah. So the 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 thing is that so if I, I mean if I design a building in a cookie cutter way, right? So meaning that you know it's the same plan. I mean it's basically, I mean it, it's basically rectangular structures. Let's let's put it as simple as that, right? Rectangular structures with like little yeah like artistic uh, design right um it's cheap it's the cheapest way to produce it right because if you like say if you are you know not in uh, the architect but let's say if you're the building engineer right you know um i suppose you like it simple structures right it makes it easier for you to plan things Right. Yeah. If you just like, okay, well, okay, I know that the building is rectangular, so I know that my the pipes that I don't know, um, connect the sewage system with let's say the building, right, they also straight. Right? I think things like that, right? It yeah. uh it 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 it, it, it eases the uh, logistical process of uh, creating the building, right? Constructing it. Uh, and also maintaining it. Um, and so for all these reasons, the architect is hemmed in. Uh, the architect still has to make a living though, right? 
So, well, how are you going to do? Well, you know, you you just do what the funders want you to do, which is pick the most conservative style. <laughs> and that's why the architecture, um, you know, uniqueness has uh, declined a lot. Originality, right? <laughs> I guess because everything is just like duplicated, like you said, cookie cutter. You know, it's cheaper, cost, uh, cost, uh, benefit kind of analysis. You know. Yeah, and, and then again, if if you say well, everything is cost benefit. I mean, well, then there there you go. I mean, then it's like well, then the architecture boringness is actually good, right? Boring is good. Um. But you see, the problem is that you see, even the most neoliberal capitalist person, right, as an adult, must have grown up as a child with some degree of, you know, the the other things that you mentioned, your know, originality, creativity, empathy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we could, we, we, yeah. I want to throw in one. Maybe a little utopianism is okay every now and then, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and we grow up with that. I believe we, we grow up with that, and then, so I, I I do I do have somewhat of a Rousseauian perspective on this, right? Where he says that you know, uh, we used to be noble savages, and then the civilization corrupted us uh, completely. Um, and I think there's something to it, right? I mean, it's, it's only when you when you grow up, and you know, let's say. I don't know, let's say your father is a banker, right? Thinks in a very new liberal way. And then it's by being socialized by your father um, that all of a sudden you take on the mindset of the banker. And then if and then you, let's say if you refuse to do so, right? Let's say you become an artist and then, you know, your banking uh, family will look down on you, right? Yeah. Um, because you know you, you are you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you you, you want to abandon your family, or whatever you know, uh, you're pursuing something silly, right? Um, now, but if it's a very rich family, however, I mean that, that's quite interesting too, right? If it's a very rich family, uh, let's say a rich industrialist, he has let's say five children. And let's say four of them, you know, stay in the family business. You know, they operate different parts of it in different parts of the country. Um, and then the fifth child, you know, is like the artist in the family, right? Would be you know either producing the art himself or would be an art collector. You know, uh, that's oftentimes what would happen as well, right? Um, and 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 then that would be okay, right? So you you can have a few. You know the philanthropists and you know um, I suppose creative um, you know, artists within the family, right? Um, if it's that wealthy, um, and it, it's not ideal um, because I, yeah, I, I, I think the ideal arrangement should be because so I think that talent is um equally distributed across the entire population mm -hmm. um now and wealth of course is not so that is to say the chances that you find a creative person born into a rich family which under the current system is ideal right because because only they can pursue their art without commercial pressure um, but they're but they're too rare, right? I mean, ideally, I mean, so you wanted to spread it out and like through a universal basic income or something like that, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And in those circumstances, I think you can, you know, you can wait for. I mean, it's much more likely that you'll find among the general population a group of people that are creative, right? Um, and and then you let them flourish. Um, yeah, I mean, that, 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 would, that would sort of be the ideal outcome. Uh, uh, Larry, do you think that with UBI 
It will also encourage more autonomy of decision making when it regards to occupations that people decide upon. Like they have more autonomy there. The idea is, is that because they have a universal basic income, then they're not coerced into specific jobs or professions they may, may not really really like to do that for them don't they don't see any social value in it but with ubi it would uh kind of embrace or broaden you know uh different occupations and professions that we never considered you know as uh being so valuable to society because we never thought of them as being valuable at first you know um but yeah, you could, die, it could like flourish, you know, at least that that could flourish and offer more opportunity. Yeah, it could spawn new occupations. Um, yeah. and, and, and definitely, I mean, there's no disincentive effect to like with welfare. Um, because I mean, right, right now, I mean, in the current system, I mean, if I say you work a job and I tax, you know, half of it away immediately, um, that's evidently a disincentive, right? Um, you, therefore, you don't have that in the UBI world. Um, and I always like to tell people, I mean, it's important to use the right metaphor. I mean, if you use, you know, the, the floor versus the ceiling, right? So if you think that UBI is a ceiling, you know, then it's a bad policy, right? It means that, you know, I get the welfare and then I, I lie on the hammock and I don't want to work at all. Uh, that, that That's a ceiling metaphor. And, um, I think it's a floor, right? It's it's it allows you to stand on it, and you know, which means you can feed yourself, you can find a place to live, uh, and then if you want to go above that, um, you know, by you know being an artist or by starting a business or whatever, um, th th then the 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 path would be open to you, right? Uh, I mean, my worry is that you know if we don't give that path to a lot of people. I mean, I spoke with a middle class friend of mine, and you know, he you know has a good job. Um, I also was doing the PhD for many years, um, and he hadn't finished because he ran out of funding. Then he wanted to do other things for a while, and then he ended up defending anyway uh, this dissertation. Uh, but he said, you know, regardless of what he was doing in life, there was a safety net. Because his family is like his father's a lawyer, like making lots of money, and and he could always move back with the family if he needed to. Um, and so he knew that there was a safety net which allowed him to, uh, you know, even for a few years of you know like living a vagabond lifestyle, he would be able to do that, right? Um, and then and it's sort of, and if you're working class. Yeah, you know, that, that that's not how you think about it. I mean, the working class mentality is like. You know, I need a job. You know, I need a job all the time. Um, That's what Senate calls the hidden injuries of class, I believe. <laughs> the hidden injuries of class, you know, especially if you're working class. Now, you don't have that basic income. I mean, if, if, if uh, yeah. Uh, so like your friend, I'm assuming he's, you said he's middle class, right? Middle yeah, class. he's a middle class background. So yeah. basically, I mean, if if people are from wealthy families, they have a basic income guarantee through their parents. But uh, the only other social safety net that I think of is, is uh, that exists, you know, in the U.S. is through if there's welfare, unemployment benefits, you know, uh, or veterans, military veterans get some kind of a also safety net uh, VA. But like, yeah, but that UBI would be, I think, a step forward, you know. So I'm all, I've always been a supporter of it. And you are too, I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it would be a policy would have to be tried. And I, and I, so and it, it's reasonable to think about going back to, um, yeah. to that because of the chat GPT concern, right? Um, yeah. Because I think that the whole framing, so whenever you see any advances in AI, and then it's and then people associate it with the job loss. And then the next association is that you know it will negatively impact their own bottom line. And I think um that 
you know, this idea of like optimism about the technological future. Uh, I think we cannot enforce it on people. Um, but I think we can bring it to them by, you know, by by adding UBI to the safety net, for instance. Right. Um, now it, it, it's it's but then it's always a question of like, okay, well, when is the right time, right? When is the right time to do it? And um, and of course, yeah. I mean, if you ask any of us UBI activists, the answer is you know, always yesterday, right? Um, but um. Yeah, but for the skeptics, it's like, well, you know, uh, we're still a little bit away from that. Um, they, they, there, there is so it's quite interesting because you know how the last couple of months, right? The we see the discourse on the labor market shifting towards uh, labor shortage. Um having to do with the fact that over the next couple of years, I mean, we are facing uh, a, a shift in population age structure. Effectively, the baby boomers dropping out. I think that's a, that's a bottom yeah. line here. Um, now, the, the thing is that, I mean, so there's a much higher old age employment rate in America than in European countries. So we don't feel it as much over here, but but we are eventually facing it because, I mean, I suppose you can still work at 67 nowadays. I mean, if you don't work like as a bricklayer or some backbreaking job. Um, you but hear I mean, about the pro oh, go ahead. I was going to say the protests in France with the, uh... Uh, you know they're going from sixty two to sixty four, and uh, the protests on the on the retirement age increase, uh, just by two three years. I think there was a big trade union protest in France. So it's always interesting. But you know Turkey, I think Turkey actually is bringing it is making it uh, uh, bringing it the age down even. So I that's always interesting. Different countries, you know, have different age. Uh, you know, age for retirement. So, yeah, but the overall the direction I think is to increase, um, yeah, the retirement age. Um, uh, and then I have some right wing friends, uh, who say that the uh, French are crybabies, um, because uh, it is, you know, because many people live in countries where 65 is the general age, um, uh, and then in France it's still at 62. Um, I mean, the demographic aging, I mean, it is definitely a big factor. Uh, I think it cannot be uh, wished away. Um, but but ultimately, I think that, that automation, AI, and, uh, and aging, they work at cross purposes. And we don't know which side is relatively stronger, more influential um, in that sense. Um, So I remember from the, in, the, in the German discussions, right? The, yeah. In the lunch show, it was brought up a couple of times now, the, the aging population. Um, uh, yeah. And then and, and one of the questions, I think, in one of the shows, uh, because they invited like a, a labor economist uh, to the show. Um, and they were asking, well, okay, well, why is it that the the Germany is struggling with uh, um, attracting migrants mm -hmm. uh, to counteract aging, um, and so I, I think the most convincing answer is language. Yeah. So I th I think this is one of the big barriers because I mean if you think I mean in terms of like. You say the reputation, right? So the reputation of German made in Germany, right? The manufacturing products and um, like Mittelstand production, right? Um, uh, industrial goods. Um, I think it's machine goods. I mean, these are, it's all undoubtable, right? 
so I think people would appreciate that. Um, and, and like high skilled people from lower income countries, I think they would appreciate that. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's much harder to access Germany, perhaps. Um, that's there would be more restrictive, yeah, countries. bureaucratic, <laughs> very bureaucratic. And I believe on that show, uh, uh, they discussed the uh, uh, attempt to try to get Filipino nurses uh, because of the crisis of hiring enough care workers or uh, health professionals in Germany or people that work in old nursing homes, you know, and this bureaucratic uh, uh, problem that they have in Germany. And so a lot of times uh, other countries become more appealing because of this bureaucratic, you know, uh, it's costs money, you know, and it, there's uh, all these difficulties in trying to recruit uh, foreign workers, foreign applicants um into, into germany um so they go elsewhere uh so if english was spoken more you know a lot of more foreign uh workers would prefer those countries where english is spoken okay that's the way that, those were some of the takeaways from the show i recall that show uh there's also like an industry now that uh sort of offer services to facilitate this recruitment of foreign workers into Germany and other areas, but they sort of do it on behalf of companies and there's like a fee. So it's, uh, there's money involved, right? So they do it for a profit, uh, but they do the whole thing of application, uh, support, and then they make connections with employers. It's kind of like a, what do you call it? Work staffing companies that exist in the U.S. It's a similar model. They have that in in, in Europe now too. Uh, but those those workers usually end up in the healthcare uh, sector. Um, occasionally, even teachers. They may even sometimes recruit uh, teachers uh, out of out of Germany, out, outside of Germany. Right. So. That's interesting. Yeah. What's surprising with me, though, I mean, you look at the United States and, you know, this, this story about teacher shortages, K through 12, uh, and difficulty in, in, in recruiting foreign teachers and the, the, the difficulty in even, you know, acquiring teaching certification or alternative credentials. Uh, it's challenging. So that's probably the reason why there may be a lot of foreign teachers that would like to teach in the United States, but there's difficulty in the whole process, you know, and uh, bureaucracy, you know, real bureaucratic. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. so if, I mean, if you think about demography, right. Um, one one thing that's quite interesting is that it seems to be that the world, with a few exceptions, I mean, they're moving in tandem. Um, and what what, I, what do I mean by that? So, if you look at just the European cluster, the North American cluster, then the East Asian cluster, so like Japan, South Korea, China, etc. Um. And they seem to be moving in tandem, right? Because if you look at in each of these countries, just examining the big cohorts, right, that were born, let's say, in the just in the twentieth century, uh, because of, obviously the the previous cohorts no longer matter because they all passed away. Um, it's basically nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties. And maybe, you know, the the first few years of the seventies, some in some cases, but it's mainly fifties and sixties, right? Yeah. Um, and that 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 that's a big cohort, right? And then there was a dip, you know. So seventies there was a dip, eighties uh, was also lower. Uh, some some like as. Yeah, and then, and then and then like late eighties it goes up again, right? Um, and then, uh, and then the nineties, um, also, you know, sizable cohort. Um, and then the trend since two thousand is is a downward trajectory. I mean, it's 
and then and then during COVID, I mean, th- there's been a drastic reduction in births in almost every country so in the world. Yeah. Um, now you could say, well, okay, the pandemic is only two years, three years, um, and people might be going back to normal again. Um, some practices and habits, however, I mean, they seem to be transforming. Like, for instance, like normalizing hybrid working uh, or distance working, um, you know, or uh, it, 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 just like reducing the amount of interactions that exist between people. I mean, that is usually not a good sign for fertility, I would say. Yeah. Um. So the overall trend now is that okay. So if if the fifties, sixties generation is disappearing from the scene, um, does say primarily from the labor market, they they're still gonna live long lives, right? So they're gonna get up to you know mid eighties, ninety, or whatever. Um, yeah, if if they're not working, then yeah, then they would have to be sustained by the younger generations effectively. Um, uh-huh. and, and then I would say, then well, you know, hope then we have to hope that actually AI is going to be fast enough. Uh, yeah, because if we, if if we if we do get to the point where much of the you know, let's say care work in particular, I mean, uh, in the hospital system, um, home care, etc. Uh, if, if some of that could be automated and handled by robotics, uh, I think, uh, like in Japan, they're trying to do that. Um, yeah, uh, I, saw, I saw that, by the way. It's like a robotic <laughs> nurse or something. Yeah. That's right, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah if, if that were to work out, yes, I think then the Demographic crunch isn't going to be as big as feared, mm-hmm. um, but nonetheless, I mean the, the the net tax burden obviously on the younger generations would probably uh, increase, um, and and so in, and here's the thing, right? So. Now, all of the developed countries, so all of the rich countries, now all at the same time, they're facing this crunch, right? I mean, it, it, it's because, I mean, it's quite interesting. I mean, the mark, you know, just like we were talking earlier about this, like Adorno Horkheimer, this uh, concept of conformity, right? Conformity of cultural tastes. Yeah. Uh, and that one form of conformity. I believe is the demographic trajectory as well, right? Whereas because it's so similar with the other countries, that means every country is facing the labor shortage crunch at the same time. Right? So then every country in the rich countries are scrambling to get the poor countries to come to them. Um but then you're competing for that same pool, right? Uh, for the same pool of people. Um, and and then the other issue is like, okay, so in the areas where you have very high rates of fertility, right, the sub-Saharan Africa, right, mm-hmm. where the HDI is the lowest, right, the Human Development Index, in terms of you know levels of education, you know, well-being, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, um. If you want to bring in some people from the demographically growing countries, um, it, it's go, it was it's going to be a major effort to uh, integrate them into the society, into the mainstream society. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so, so so these are all you know big challenges that are all happening at the same time. Um, and uh, yeah, you don't you don't want to be the policymaker in, in those circumstances. Um, yeah, I, 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 I saw this um, commentary by 
my former professor is a demographer, uh, mm -hmm. Stuart Boston, uh, uh, teaches in Khalifa University, Dubai. Um, and yeah, he, he was talking about like the Chinese demographic challenge, um, which in some ways um, is more dramatic than the Western countries. Because China has always been a country of uh, immigration rather than immigration. People leaving. Yeah. And then, and so if on top of that, I mean, you add very low rates of fertility, I mean, basically collapsing um, since 2015. I mean, it, the, 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 in the Western countries, it's been a decline, but it's sort of like a gradual one. Uh, and I think in China, it's a very steep drop, actually. Um, and uh, it's, it, it is in a difficult situation. Now then, and Boston does not believe that like putting more pressure on women to have children is going to work, right? Um, you know, there the, the must be... The, structural forces at play all at the same time right the fact that okay so you have the, 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 the this, you had for many for, for two years now the zero covid policy which they just lifted uh so the economy was in a standstill um the cost of living is still relatively high especially in the big cities where most housing of costs too right Housing costs in cities in China, right? Exactly. Yeah. So housing costs elevated. Um, education expenses. Um, if you're, I mean, if you're working class, then you know you never have the money. But but if you're middle class, um, there is a private education um craze that's going on, right? Where basically you have to, um. You know, maybe maybe you send your kid to a public school, but then you, uh, but then in the afternoon you you pay for extra cl classes. You know, that's their version of extracurricular activities, which actually, what what they mean by extracurricular activities is extra dash curricular. Right? <laughs> so it's basically more learning, right? Uh, um, mm -hmm. and um. Yeah, and, and, and because it, there's so much anxiety. I mean, there's so much status anxiety, right? Because you, your fear is like, well, all the other parents are pushing the kid to do well in school. Uh, and if I'm not doing that, then, you know, I cannot reproduce my class status, right, to my child. Um. So, 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 so these are all sources of, uh, you know, substantial amounts of anxiety for sure in society. Um, and um, and then people say, well, actually, the simplest solution um, is to abstain from uh, child rearing. Um, and it's interesting that this is like whole generation wide trend. Really, I mean, with the millennials, I mean, we we see that. I mean, you know, one of my friends who's also graduated from here, Princeton, um, like he's, he's just a few years older than me. I mean, like early to mid thirties, and and he's like, yes, I want to have a vasec vasectomy. Now he doesn't have children, right? Um, but he's like, yeah, I never want to deal with having children right um so yeah there, there, there is a sense of um but I, I the main idea being that like having children is not um is not part of the life plan not part of the life design mm -hmm. um The out, I guess the outlook is also very, you know, uh, uh, anti-family. Maybe like we can't afford a family, or you know, more individualistic. 
Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Do you think that, uh, to ask a question, uh, this sort of sounds like the problem of both social reproduction and in some case, uh, physical reproduction, but that's fertility, but the, the problem of social reproduction of particularly working classes, but people that uh, don't have economic means. Uh, social reproduction, you, you mean having a roof over your head and eating? Yeah, there's, there's, uh, you know, in Italy, there's a classic example where they started to have abandoned villages, and there was just real de facto such a low fertility that the even in Spain they had these villages that were just dying out, and they had no one living in the villages anymore. So this is a social reproduction idea that or problem of social reproduction that there's not a continuation of a population. You know, they start to not have children, and then they, the next generation has even fewer children. And then before you know it, there's nobody living in the villages anymore, or they've moved even away. That could that could happen. You know, maybe I, they would. I, I was watching a news report. I think it was about uh, Italian low fertility in some of these rural villages, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know the uh, reporters, uh, the camera team was showing um, this this one woman. Uh, who was having a baby right in the maternity ward and you have this and, and in this ward you have like maybe 30 beds or something mm -hmm. and and her bed was the only one that was occupied right <laughs> so, so she gets the full attention of the medical staff wow. um, uh, and uh again because because I, I must assume like there used to be days uh, uh, meaning mm -hmm. uh that there used to be uh, a time when um, you know, but when the maternity ward was probably full, right? Um, and then you yeah. can you they built the capacity for you know uh, expecting a certain number of births. Um, you know, and there's a real drop of yeah, real drop, radical drop. I want to give you another example. I watched uh, Bayerisches Fernsehen, uh, Bavarian television show, uh, about a week ago. And they were tracing this phenomenon of rural farmers committing suicide. Similarly, we often hear about it, you know, in India, this rural of farmers committing suicide, but this is Bavaria. And one of the things that they discovered uh, with suicides happening among farmers, these are the some of the not massive farms, but rural farms in Bavaria, in rural areas. That it's uh, a question that the, the family members don't want to continue, and then it falls on the last person to do it all, uh, and everybody else is seeking different kind of occupation. It's financially very difficult to maintain a farm, uh, so then the younger ones uh, uh, abandon uh, the profession or lifestyle of being a farmer, and then the and then usually there's suicide cases where the older farmer, you know, is uh, depressed and wants to continue the legacy of farming, but uh, the children don't. And the children have sort of abandoned, the, you know, the, the parent. Well, and, India, uh, in India, the idea is um, suicide comes from debt, right? Yeah. Seeds um, are in the Right, because... Yeah, they purchase the seeds, but then you can only use the seeds once, so you have to purchase repurchase it. Yeah. Uh, then the problem is if you have like a bad harvest year, or if you have, or actually even in the years where you have a bumper harvest, mm -hmm. but everybody else has a bumper harvest, so then the price goes down, right? Yeah, the price goes down, but then the loan burden is the same, right? So that means you cannot pay pay your loans, right? Um, and then the idea is like if the farmer commits suicide because the debt doesn't transfer to the next generation. Oh, then, that's why. Then, then, then presumably, um, debt is relieved. The debt yeah, is only relieved. Debt relief, yeah. So you can pass the oh, farm to the next okay. generation without debt. But I mean, it, it ultimately it doesn't solve the problem because yeah. the son who is inheriting, I mean, the that farm, was a debt. you know, it, it's still a trap in the same. You know, a clientele yeah. of the Monsanto kind of system, right? Um, yeah, uh, that's but, that's a that's an interesting analogy because I, 
I, I was I had some understanding of the global south, you know, uh, India suicides that I was always thinking relative poverty and debt. I understood debt and loans and I knew land was, uh, you know, also getting kind of expensive for farmers. Uh, but I guess what I'm trying to argue is in, in the case of Bavaria, this is like, you know, Western uh, rural area of West, well, it used to be West Germany, you know, the, the part that uh, there is at, at the thesis that I'm going to make is this a problem of social reproduction of the profession itself, that the, the farming profession is in decline, decay. And there's this view that we need, you know, the, the, young, the new generation doesn't want to take up that, those positions. And within their own family, you know, they, they uh, abandon their family members and then they uh, uh, seek, you know, college education if it's available. But you know, uh, if you have your Abitur or if you do a Fachhochschule, whatever. And so I'm not sure. I think it's creating stress on those few farmers that are still doing it uh, uh, for our lifestyle, not as a hobby, you know. So there's fewer and fewer and fewer doing it, which creates, uh, again, this just problem. But I don't know. Uh, suicide may be one indicator but it, there may be other indicators yeah but what's interesting about farming is that i mean we're still seeing more and more you know like wheat being produced right i mean yeah. uh, more and more cattle being raised i mean i think that the overall amount of agricultural productivity is you know as high as it's ever been and um mm -hmm. as, as as reading the the thesis by uh, Aaron Bananov, um, he's uh, now a sociologist in uh, Syracuse University. Um, but it, but his his dissertation was about the global history of uh, of unemployment, um, uh, and uh, so he has three empirical chapters um, uh, on uh, you know deruralization. Uh, then deindustrialization, uh, and then population boom, which is you know about the baby boomers. Um, and he says that each of these factors contribute to an oversupply of labor, um, uh, and then you know that's part of unemployment, right? Uh, and deruralization is the simple idea that. Because agricultural mechanization increases productivity of uh, farming production, um, you just don't need as many farmers to feed mm -hmm. the entire population. Basic supply demand, I guess, right? Yeah. So, because it, it's it's an interesting thing, right? Where you could be convinced, or many people could be convinced to buy multiple gadgets, right? Like to buy a TV set, to buy a laptop, to buy um, a phone, and so forth. So you can purchase a lot of, you know, um, manufactured goods. Um, but with food, I mean, there is a limit, right? I mean, the average person. I mean, of course, we have the obesity crisis, but I mean, if you look aside from that, I think that because there's a limited demand for food, right? Just by how much you can consume, right? Um, it means that the more food you're producing, um, you know, the less farmers you will need because you're going to be, because you always want to produce a, an amount of food that um, corresponds to the level of population, right? Yeah. Um, Otherwise you overproduce, right? And you don't get the right price. <laughs> yeah, well, then you... Well, well, uh, you know, yeah. Well, so what what the rich countries are doing when you overproduce, which does happen, um, then they get the government to purchase the surplus, um, and then yeah. maybe uh, sell it to usually third world countries or something or developing countries. Uh, or I I I, no, I, th I think there's another mechanism. I think it's called export promotion, mm -hmm. um, where basically there would be export subsidies that the rich countries would pay to the farmers. Uh, to sell it in you know poorer countries, um, 
And of course, it, it's, it, it's, it's been one of the disputes actually between developing and developed countries, right? Which is to get the rich countries to stop subsidizing the uh, agricultural produce. Yeah. Um, because it, it, because why, why is it a problem? Because the developing countries, the main cash crop, I mean, well, is food effectively? I mean, right? It's, um, and you you don't allow them to, you know, build up expertise, build up productivity, etc. Um, by f effectively flooding the domestic markets with Western produced, um, uh, agricultural products. Mm -hmm. Um, damage and crash there. Uh economies yeah or, or yeah yeah. Uh, yeah yeah so this is this is this is part of this world systems theory argument right yeah. so the wallerstein on, <laughs> yeah wallerstein um so uh -huh. you know, you create the dependencies among the developing countries or the less developed countries um uh, yeah, you, and, you, and, and you and you don't allow them to develop, and and it's important. So development actually is is hugely important because if you want to make progress on any of these, you know, HDI Human Development Index indicators, um, you know, you you have to bump up in the standard of living. Um, that, I mean, there's no other way around it. Um. And that, that that that's where I would actually take issue with, with the degrowth activists um, and the and, and the and the environmental movement. Uh, so, I, so so I mean obviously the, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I mean so this so so on the fundamental point, like there's no disagreement that I have with degrowth and with environmentalism. Um, um, me, me, and so I fully agree. Like climate change, like unsustainable, we have to reach one point five Celsius target, right? Um, I agree fully with that. Um, you know, my my objection is just short term. You know, we we want to bring the people in developing countries at the very least to a standard of living uh, that we find in the West that we find is, you know, humanly acceptable, so to speak. And of course, like you, you can language in, in deep poverty, I mean, and, and, and we have done so, you know, throughout human history, right? Um, absolute but, poverty, yeah. Yeah, absolute poverty, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. I mean, but um but we have the tools we have the means to to stop that right to stop absolute poverty uh and i think we should use them now the only way how we can sort of um approach the environmental movement meet them you know more than halfway hopefully is by allowing the developing countries to leapfrog technology. So basically, I mean, imagine, because if you think about so what made the Western countries rich originally was coal, right? Burning coal. Because that's what powered the steam engine, right? And the power of the Industrial Revolution. Um, a lot of developing countries are using coal. Uh, coal is still actually a growing resource of energy uh, consumption. Um, China is still one of the countries that opens uh, coal mines. Um, so we want them to leapfrog. So basically, go from coal straight to renewable energy. Right. Um, I think it's part of the IPCC. Oh, no, no, not IPCC. There's, there's another. There's another COP conference of the parties. Um, mm -hmm. There is an agreement every year. They discuss how much climate finance the rich countries should give to the poor countries, 
Um, and also in what form, right? Is it going to be loans? Is it going to be grants? Hopefully, mostly grants. Um, the original agreement was hundred billion dollars climate finance. Um, that that goal was set, I think, in two thousand nine in the Copenhagen uh, agreement. Um, I think I looked at a chart recently. I think it was eighty eighty five billion dollars. I think was uh, allocated recently. Um. Now, what do these numbers mean? I mean, I I don't know. I mean, does it like how f to what extent? You know, does it mean that you know that there's enough renewable energy, for instance, in developing countries? Um, it's a big question, but uh, but we we definitely have to see more of that. So we have to meet social and environmental targets at the same time definitely yeah uh, and uh, it's it's difficult it's for sure i mean uh, it requires yeah a lot of coordination and um, uh, uh larry do you think that besides environmental movements in the global north there would also probably need to be environmental movements in the global south. You know, that this much of uh, its its movements that are strong in the global north, if you think of Greta, you know, the, as a, a key figure, you know, uh, Swedish uh, activists, but the lack of environmental movements that emerge through the global south and it's uh, in an in imbalance, right? So maybe that that's missing in the mix, you know, because it's always like global north institutions, global north in, initiatives, global north ecological movements, and uh, but you don't see as much. I mean, you you can see sometimes Brazil. There's Amazon uh, kind of squatters activists. Don't get me wrong. There's there's activists also in the global south, but overwhelmingly it's always this image you have of the global north, you know. Um, well, it's it's obvious the reason why because yeah. um, the CO two emissions of the poor countries is just much lower. I right, mean, it, right. it's it's just like I mean, what do you want them to cut? I mean, <laughs> you know, for for the, for them, I think the you know, I, I think the struggle is quite the opposite, right? Where <clears throat> I I think they do want they they want to pollute more just to get to up to a certain level of living standard which they find to be acceptable um yeah so it's so if you remember the garrett harden argument the, the tragedy of the commons but basically the simple idea is that it's it's rational for you to increase your income even though it comes at, at the expense of the sustainability oh, yeah. of the entire community right um and we're in a little bit of that scenario now um and again, that's why that's why I keep on harping on the point of climate finance and mm -hmm. renewable energy, right? Uh, technology sharing with developing countries, um, because then you know they can grow the economy, hopefully with you know less you know carbon pollution impact. Um, yeah, and also in global south, I remember there was a speech by Mia Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados, uh, one of the. Oh yeah, Caribbean islands. Um, and um, it was in the uh, conference of the parties meeting, I think. Um, and 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 she noted that that yeah, you know, developing countries they are paying the costs for you know global warming quite drastically because of the rising sea level. Uh, and so if you have countries that are exposed, so every island in the South Pacific and the Caribbeans, the Indian Ocean, uh, so these are very exposed places. Uh, so for them, even like five meters of, um, you know, increase in sea level is threatening. Yeah, um, threatening, yeah. Yeah. Um, so emigration would probably be 
be be an issue right so refugees um so there, there's some so some of the developing countries that are already extraordinarily exposed um i i i think they will uh you know they they will surely you know uh there'll be some kind of activism that will occur but also i think you know this idea of like protesting i think um i mean it requires a certain level of you know human development index i think um also um especially when it comes to like how should i say i mean so like um was it ronald inglehart who talks oh, yeah. about like this post materialism stuff? Um, so you so you have this sort of materialistic concerns, yeah. right? Yeah, world value um, survey, I think. He, yeah, yeah, the Go world, world value survey, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so the yeah. idea is so you have if you're poor, you worry about basic necessities and economics, right? Um, and if you are more well off, then I think you can focus more on uh. Well, it's also I mean, ultimately, it's also about economic concerns, but like thinking more long term, right? Like when it comes to the environment, right? Because I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, people are worried about you know income, but also the preservation of of health and well being, right? I think in his model, he even calls it what well, survival values are more prevalent uh, in developing countries. And individualistic, I think he calls it. Uh, he has this graph that he kind of uh, that they created. Uh, individualistic and materialistic kind of values are more common in uh, you know, or, or even Protestant, you know, uh, countries. Uh, richer, you know. So yeah, yeah. Survivalist values are more common in uh, the poorest uh, countries, just to struggle to survive, you know. Yeah, I just re yesterday yeah. I was watching a documentary about um, uh, Madagascar, and uh, it was a, a Deutsche Welle TV. Uh, I think they have in English, um, and it was about um, the drought uh, that was afflicting them, uh, particularly the south side of Madagascar, where, um, yeah, there, there's not been a lot of rainfall uh, in that area. And and it's interesting. And then the reporter was asking one of the women that was living there. Um, and basically, they, the, the way how they survive is they they pick um, the fruits that grow on the cactus. Um, because you know, obviously, like in a very dry region, the cactus is probably the only plant that can uh, grow there. Um, and uh, yeah, and then there's some fruits that grow there, and then she picks those up. Um, and uh, and, and then she was asked, like, is it because she has like grandchildren or something? Um, the other lady, so uh, like, what do you think about the future of your grandchildren, right? Like, what do you want them to be doing, and you know, how, how do you imagine the future to be? And her answer was, I, I can't even think about that. I have to worry about surviving the next day, basically. Um, yeah. Uh, it's... And, and, and that's, and that's, that's sort of like, because, you know, like, every, like you, you, you go throughout your day and oftentimes you think about trifling concerns, right? Like, you know, what's my next job going to be and um you know uh you mean in the west we have this yeah in the west yeah yeah I mean, we have this uh, sort of money uh acquisition uh other we have uh, uh western problems right but yeah, this okay. daily struggle for getting water or even bathroom access um uh, and housing you know is a big struggle in the global south that's my read. That was my research focus. You know, uh, I can only imagine this. I mean, just surviving uh, open defecation, you know, people that uh, 
uh, lack basic access to food, water. Uh, yeah, know, for, for, for the water yeah. access, it was quite interesting um, because uh, so so the, the whole village would gather together and then they would have this truck um, that would take the people and they, and they would have these uh, canisters uh, where they would fill the water uh, and then they would take them to uh to to a location that's a little bit further away uh that has water right so, which suggests that the, in the location in the villages where they're living there's no water effectively so they have to be taken elsewhere in order to uh fetch the water uh, and if you and if you imagine like if you spend most of your day mm -hmm. just looking for water right um well, is, you can't uh, do anything else right there's also the issue of land tenure insecurity so it's that you don't even know if you can stay where you're at or located because if you're in an informal settlement or if you have you know uh, living in a village uh you don't know if it may be bulldozed or you know if something happens to your home so land there's a lot of land insecurity uh, i think in the global south so i'm not not sure madagascar specifically but like uh there's some hot spot regions you know where this is a problem serious issue uh so this are, these are problems that we never think of in the global north i mean there's housing issues but even poverty or homelessness uh, but nothing in comparison to what we see in Madagascar, you know, and you, you just, you know, you, you dressed it perfectly. I mean, you illustrated it. So water, food. Well, like with that. housing, I mean, like, yeah, they would probably live in huts, right? Uh, that they built. Yeah. And this um, call up, I mean, yeah, this, uh, you know, almost zero state uh, involvement in providing any sort of housing for the poor. Uh, and so it's totally precarious. Uh, and it's, it can, you know, it can be taken away at any time. I mean, it's... Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. See, if you think about tropical regions, right, um, just in the point of housing. Um, yeah. It, it is the case that, like the closer to the equator you live, um, the 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 less you have to worry about, yeah, the quality of housing, um, and also the quality of your clothing. Right. So ba basically, you could run around naked. I mean, just to really simplify that, right? Um, which very few people do nowadays because you know globalization. You know, there's like enough like you know clothing traits that's happening um but you know in, in the old days right i mean you live close to the equator i mean you could run around basically naked um it doesn't get really cold um yeah you might okay so you, you might not want to sleep completely out in the open because you know a lion might eat you uh yeah. so you know so you might be building you know you know, a mud hut or something, um, yeah. like with locally available material. Um, you probably live rent free. You know, I mean, you could sustain yourself if you could just uh, avoid uh, local authorities or uh, people that were trying to implement rent in some form of rent. I, I, I suspect there are still areas in the world today where there's kind of squatting you know just living off the land and there's no official legal title there's no title to the land and we know that sometimes that happens in uh, uh humanitarian cases you know where there's massive amounts of people moving uh that there's at least temporary uh, uh informal settlements and then they turn into more permanent but a lot of times there's no rent rent extraction right so if you can survive you live there you can feed you know feed yourself or then it might be a way to do it. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, so it, there's some cases where rationalization 
occurs. Uh, so I did a case study of Singapore for book chapter and uh, um and one of the ways of um you know the country's founding father Lee Kuan Yew, I mean his development vision project uh was to make the country um you know like rich. Uh and one of the ways to do that was to get rid of the squatter housing uh and replace them so basically, you know, like take the people out of the squatter huts, then tear it apart, and then replace it with a high-rise apartment building. Um, and those apartment buildings, they have the, you know, amenities that used to not exist. So, you know, it has air conditioning units. It has, like, proper bathrooms uh, and everything. But now you're charging rent for it, right? Yeah. So right. that's the key because then what happens is that then you see the people in that in that community are then going to say, okay, I don't want to live in the mud hut anymore. Uh, I want to live in that nice apartment. But if I want to live in the nice apartment, I have to earn wages. And if I want to, and, and so I have to have a job. If I want to keep the job, which means I have to want to continue to pay my mortgage, right? Um, then I have to, you know, work every day, right? I mean, it's not, it, 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 it's not the life of like a day laborer, effectively, right? Because I mean, like the idealized life of a day laborer would be that, you know, you know, you you might be working on some days just enough to get by for the day. And some days you might be working harder, so you can save up for a few days, and then you not you don't work. You know, um, but here it's like no, you 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 want solid working class, right? Uh, with regular paychecks, and that, that's effectively what happened. I mean, so he used that narrative of housing and modernization. In order to get the people to be uh, workers uh, in in a very yeah Weberian rationalized way, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the result is that the country is richer than 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 the other countries in Southeast Asia. So um, so it clearly has worked. Um, like the, yeah, yeah, and and. It's, yeah, and so that, that that's why you know, yeah. So so in the Lee Kuan Yew's vision, I think squatting was uh, Singapore. Was... Would you say they're more punitive too? I mean, the state is more authoritarian, uh, and more stricter. Yeah, I mean, it, like when it comes to squatting, I don't know. I don't know specifically with Singapore. I mean, do they tolerate? They don't tolerate it. I guess they just imprison the squatters or. Uh, are there some cases where they tolerate it? I'm I'm curious. Oh, well, they would they would just kick them out. I mean, okay, and, and yeah, uh... they're very different in Brazil. In Brazil, there's some you know toleration, and if it's uh, maybe indigenous, you know, or there's some toleration by the state. So I don't know. There's different parts of the world in the global south where you have different responses to, by government and state. You know. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, one one other interesting thing. I mean, I was reading an article. It was something I think in Bangkok and Thailand, and they were they were talking about the getting rid of the street food vendors. Yeah. Uh, because so traditionally, because you know Bangkok, I mean, global city, huge city, um, people coming in from the countryside, informal labor. Uh, you know, like rickshaw driving or taxi driving, or but you know, or being a street food vendor, right? And the the municipal government has the idea to basically become a normal global city. Um, and, and what does that mean? Well, it means that. Well, you still have a lot of food options, but uh, they would be rationalized, right? So, 
Um, so probably the, the first thing that we probably, what that means is, you know, you're going to have your McDonald's and your Burger Kings and, you, you, you know, your, your global food chains, right? Uh, and, and then secondarily, you also have like, like the local restaurateurs, right? Um, but importantly, like, you know, everybody should be paying rent <laughs> to, to the government, right? That's the key, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, like you, they, 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 they don't want to see like the fully informal street food vendors, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. which I don't know. I mean, like if you're sort of like a romantic tourist and you're like, okay, I know that the city is famous for the street food vendors and I'm a foodie, whatever, right? So I want to try it out. Um, and you get to see less and less of that because the city planners they think that part of being a global city means uh to look like every other city right which, Western which city. Means, like, i guess it means in a nutshell reducing your informal economy you know <laughs> or regulating it more you know? yeah yeah effectively that's what it means um yeah. and um and that's that, that's that, that's a very interesting development i mean So obviously, like you know, we're talking from a privileged perspective. I mean, in the sense that, like, we're not going to be working as street food vendors, so very unlikely. Um, so of course, you know, from our perspective, it's like, yeah, of course, we want to go to eat in proper restaurants, uh, you know, indoors, where we're getting you know served proper food and whatever. Um, but I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe there is value to you know. To, to having uh, street food. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. you might make the argument that there is more autonomy among informal laborers because they uh, are not in a, a you know a, a regular employment kind of relation, and and so it's just pure cash income, so it's not easily as taxed. So they have more autonomy sometimes. The downside is with informal economy is whenever there's an economic problem, the government can't even really do anything because it's so massive. They don't know where to start. So if you think of, uh, you know, so, like when something like COVID happens and in, in a poor country and they want to try to sort of keep employment going or the, the economy going, there's just so many, too many people in informal labor that the, the state doesn't know what to do. You know, again, I'm not an economist, but I can imagine that, that just because it is such a disorganized, you know, thing uh, that you have individual street vendors, you have uh, so much informality that you don't even know <laughs> where your informal businesses are mostly food some of it may be transportation some of it may be just street vendors selling stuff uh, and so the state can't even sometimes react when there is a downturn you know implement keynesian policies or something you know or like give out cash grants right uh, but in you know in the case think of western countries you did have the state could at least funnel money with what cash loans paid pay loans to keep it going you know uh to, to to like benefit employers so they have money to pay their employees but with informal laborers i can see it uh being problematic because it's such a massive thing right? well it's also, also yeah. i think the main issue is that it's about state capacity right yeah so, so if you have like a huge informal labor market informal labor economy i mean not only does the state not have the tax registers in order to know who should receive benefits, right? Um, which you have, I mean, if you have a big formal labor force, right? Um, but also you just don't generate tax revenues in the first place, right? Because, I mean, if, if you have like all the street food vendors, it's like, yeah, okay, well, of course we don't pay taxes, right? Why should I pay taxes? Um but then it's like, well, they cannot expect anything from the government because the government doesn't have the resources yeah. to support them. Because I mean, I mean, because if you think about like, what is the government? I mean, you know, oh yeah, the government is giving me free things. I mean, well, the government is redistributing, right? Yeah. 
they 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 yeah i mean there's this idea of like monetary creation by the government um which is also true but it, it can only happen within limits right i mean ultimately you know most of the government financing you know maybe not at the initial point but ultimately uh is is has to be funded from taxation so yeah. you're having to take from somebody the money and so you can give it to somebody else who needs it the most agree um, fully <laughs> yeah uh, so um so then but then if you say well okay i want this pro status response um well then the conclusion would have to be um to be anti um informal economy effectively right you, you, idea so that, that's why I like i mean if you remember the classification struggles in um the uber industry right where oh, basically yeah. the, the, the the you know the the dispute was so the uber perspective is you are an independent contractor as a driver and the driver perspective is no we are your employees right <laughs> We're supposed to get the W twos from you, right? Um, so each side has a different kind of conceptualization of what a proper employment contract is, right? So Uber's perspective is, you know, the driver takes all the risk, and then, you know, we of course collect the benefit because you know because we provide the platform, right? Um, and then the driver perspective is. You know, we need the balance, basically, right? Because I mean, it is true that the company ultimately is in a more powerful position, right? Um, yeah, they they get to you know ultimately set the algorithms for the pricing. Uh, they get to you know, receive a cut that they give to the shareholders, right? Um, and Yeah, and then and then the workers they don't want to take on the full risk, which would which they would have to do as an independent contractor. Because as a, as a contractor, you just you you don't get reimbursement for the downside, right? Like let's say your car breaks down, um, or you get stranded somewhere or whatever. Um that's a yeah, difficult position to be an uber driver yeah definitely right so in their person so the uber driver perspective is like you know we we want to be workers you know we want to be we want to receive a formal contract formal labor contract um and i mean even you know for ourselves i mean like if, if we were well i guess i'm no longer a graduate student but uh but 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 there was this initiative that was going on, you know, to you know unionize the place, right? The graduate students. Um very difficult to do. Um in some places it was probably easy to easier to do. Um, you know, some of it has to do with, you know, how much union backing do you get, like from formal labor union. Um, because they offer resources. Some of it has to do with like how competent is your own leadership, like the people that are doing the organizing. Um, then the other issue is like how well networked are you? So um, among the student body. Um, and then within that network, I mean, like how many people are supporting the union, union drive actively? Uh, and then what's the response of the administration in a university, which is usually hostile. Um, but in places where it might be less hostile, it might be easier to get the union running, right? Um, yeah, in, in, in the U.S., I mean, as remember the, um, do you remember the Volkswagen plan? There was a couple of years ago. Oh yeah, uh, there, there was an attempt of unionization. Did they um, close it down in Georgia or something. 
was it in Georgia or some southern state or Tennessee? Yeah, it was yeah. Tennessee. It was a Tennessee, I think. Yeah. And uh, and then the governor and the senator, they were all against unionization. Um, and uh, there was a big media advertising campaign against unionization. Um, and it was targeting a lot of these plant workers. Uh, um. And then it was a narrow vote against unionization, even though the um the 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 headquarters, so the Volkswagen headquarters, um was open minded to, to unionization. Right. So it was it was it wasn't it wasn't strongly in favor, but it wasn't hostile, right? Uh so the hostility came entirely from the from the government, effectively, I mean, the local government here. Um, yeah, so it's it, it it it's really it's really contextual circumstances that can uh, that determines the position of yeah, uh, unions, uh, union organization. Um, yeah, I mean, my prediction overall, I think, is that. You know, the, the 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 you know the workers are kind of facing a defensive battle ultimately, um, you know, and so the, I think it goes back to this issue of automation ultimately. Um, it's it's like I mean it's it's very hard to retain the initiative um, if the threat of automation is hanging above you. Um, well, I, I'm with you there. I mean, maybe I don't mean to interrupt you, but that wasn't that always even the issue. I mean, in the early days of industrial industrialization, I mean, if you look at the old uh reserve army of labor theory, I don't know when that was written, I think 1840s, uh, when Marx wrote that, there was already this automation happening, and uh, there was the view that. There was a strategy of the employers to desire a permanent reserve army laborers that could be used uh, sort of uh, because they are disposable, you know, they can cherry pick a few out of them. And uh, that was good for business, you know, but nowadays with automation, it seems like we go back to this possibility that we'll have a, a reserve army of service workers or you know sir, uh, army of technology workers are no longer needed and you know this AI automation that we talk about uh permanent you know people that uh lab their labor is not needed because there is so much uh competition or there's so many other people that could do it <laughs> right so I don't know I guess you think there's there's a recycling of the old reserve army of labor problem that was first proposed like Marx. Or do you think that think that's old stuff? You don't think that fits with uh, automation? You know, uh, uh, concerns nowadays. We should well, reserve worry. army of labor theory. Yeah, my view yeah. is always true as long as you have capitalism and as long as there's unemployment, right? Yeah. Right. It's quite interesting. I mean, there's no capitalist country in the world where the unemployment rate is exactly zero. Um, and I think economists, they say, well, you know, it has to do with friction in the labor market. You know, I, I, what, what they mean by that is that the, the, in every labor market, you're going to have some mismatch. Like this, You're always going to have some people who let's say, live in location A, but the jobs are in location B, which is not within commuting distance. It's too far away, right? right. Uh, so it could be location-based uh, imbalance, or it could be um, skill-based imbalance, right? So some people like have skill A, but then you need jobs and skills B, right? That's a, That sort of thing. Yeah. Um, mismatch, yeah. Yeah, yeah, some, some kind of mismatch in the, in the labor market. Uh, so that would explain, you know, maybe one or two percent of the unemployment rate. Um, but then, if the unemployment rate is like five percent, six percent, sometimes 
European countries in in America, it's more like four percent, I think. Um, you know, it it means that yeah, there, there's something deeper that's going on, effectively, right? That that, that um, mm -hmm. capitalism, um, like you you, you want to have a few people that are willing and ready to step in and take their jobs, right? Because if if because if you didn't if you didn't have that, then there would be a bidding up of of the wages, and in yeah. some sectors that's not avoidable. Like I don't know, in like doctors, for instance, because it takes so many years to become a doctor, right? So, um, credentials and all that. Yeah, credentials. So you're gonna have a lot of labor shortage always in those sectors, rising wages. Um. Yeah, but but then if like for the general like laboring sector, laboring industries, right, like the lower end of the healthcare system, right, home health aides and so forth, uh, you you always want to have people that are standing ready to take the job, right, um, to prevent you know, you know, an increase in wages. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I guess from from really from the capitalist perspective, um, mm -hmm. uh, and and we and we've had that. I mean, you know, it's. And then that's that's why the capitalist system could subsist. And if you had like a genuine full employment model, where you keep unemployment down to, you know, basically the the, the friction stuff, so which is one percent, um, that would constitute full employment, um, and it would be devastating to the capitalists ultimately. Or they or they think it will be devastating to them, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. they think that the wages will be bid so high that there will be no profits left. I mean, that, that, that that's that's how narrowly they think, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There has to be scarcity in the system, right? Something like this. <clears throat> the idea yeah. that they have to have scarcity, <laughs> even if there is no need to have scarcity. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so that's yeah. interesting. You know? uh, oh, yeah, exactly. If it intensifies or if it uh, uh, creates new avenues, unintended consequences, or new risks, you know, the manufactured risks we don't think about. Uh, uh, the world is open, right? We don't know what's going to happen, right? And what actors will take advantage or uh, pay the price for this uh, change. There's always change happening. I think we can agree with automation, there's change and it's not always precisely known the outcome yet. You know, we don't quite, we can anticipate, but we don't really often know, right? So that's the way I would. Yeah, I mean, what percentage of the workforces uh, could be uh, displaced? I mean, it's... Yeah. So the, the, the so there's this concept of technological diff diffusion, right? Um, which is different from discovery, right? So discovery is the point at which, yeah, you develop the technology. Um, so that's the inventor, but then, you know, but that's not socially relevant yet, right? So a socially relevant technology is if the companies uh, are adopting the technology in a widespread way. And, um, and so diffusion always takes much longer. Uh, so it's, it will happen long after the the invention, right? Um, meaning, meaning it has application at, at later. Yeah, diffusion, okay. yeah, means application. Yeah, widespread application. So okay. Like when you actually see most of the companies using it, right? Where it becomes a standard, okay. right? Um. Yeah. So, so we might not live to see it. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, I mean, so here's what's confusing. Because so, so within the last few years, I mean, in the 2010s, I mean, we were already seeing inklings that AI was getting better, right? Simply because the computing power has gotten so much better uh, today than it was uh, any time before. Um. Now, there is this idea of 
exponential changes, exponential improvements that are happening. Um, right? And exponential, I mean, it, it means that that AI today is not just a little bit better than it was yesterday. It is so much better. Um, and, and, and we kind of, I don't know, we might be at the cusp of it, you know, mm. might be at the cusp of it. I mean, we just saw this one email that, that I received this morning from the university administration and chat GPT. I mean, I mean, could it be the case that in five years from now, you know, that that we are going to be replaced by AI teachers. Like we, it's going to go, it's going to go all the way, basically, um, uh, in the, in in that direction. And and then maybe again, with the exception of some boutique yeah. boutique services. So I mean, if uh, probably at Princeton, I mean, it's going to be fine. Probably at an elite school here, um, you know where. You know, you're selling a boutique experience to you know upper class kids or something, right? Um, I wanted to maybe ask you, uh, Larry. Do you think this AI development trend uh, opens up this risk society momentum? I mean, that like uh, that Beck always feared about that there were these. Uh, I would put AI on that list because he he was sort of making a long list, starting with you know with the nuclear power, and then he goes to genetically modified foods. I mean, if you read Risk Society, I wonder what he would have said I mean, if if Ulrich Beck were alive today. And now we're talking about you know chat, uh, this AI uh, essay writing kind of software pods, whatever. Uh, what he would say, he would say, I told you so, you know, or would he say, uh, it's a risk if we turn it into a risk, you know, or would he say, we need to have precautionary uh, safeguards in place just in case this thing does take off in the wrong direction that we can, you know, perhaps regulate regulate it. Uh, what do you think Ulrich Beck would, if he was, you know, assuming that, uh, you want to answer that if that's too much, but you think you think you think this whole AI issue fits with this risk society thesis? You know, we're, we're dealing with un, unknown territory, unknown terrain, and we are creating our own <laughs> risks with it. You know, if we don't regulate. Yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, yes, you know, and, and 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 but and, and then and then we when we don't know when the risks become more relevant or not so you give you give you one example with nuclear weapons right okay. so we have known that nuclear weapons um have been a paradigm change in terms of warfare right since 1945 since since the americans dropped it over the two japanese cities um and and it has formed deterrence for the countries that developed the nuclear weapons. Um, and since the fall of the Soviet Union, um, so that's, you know, I was born right when the Soviet Union collapsed in December 91. Um, and, and that's why, like, the first three decades of my life is, in terms of the, you know, global security politics has been... A relatively sheltered experience, right? So, I mean, I did experience 9-11 um, and, of course, the two Middle East wars that America started. Um, but there was a sense that, okay, well, these wars are happening far away. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they were not... Intimate concern, All right, personal. Yeah, so if, if you're like, like, if you grew up in a Western country... And you don't serve in the military, right? So you're not going to be sent to those places. You know, you you're not really going to be affected directly by these conflicts. Um, and so you're like, okay, it's too far away. Um, that's why I mean, in terms of the like the 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 start of the Ukraine war, 
mm-hmm. last year. It's not the one originally 2014 because 2014 was still like it was like a like a localized conflict. You know, um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a full on invasion. Um, but the one that started last year, February, um, like when I was seeing the the, the headlines coming in. Uh, uh, you know, with that invasion, um, yeah, that, that that was that was a big shock, right? Because it was a big war. It was happening in Europe, um, so it was pretty close to the to the center of, uh, you could say, um, Western countries. Um, and then the, the nuclear threat went from. Close to zero to quite high. I mean, it was it wasn't very high. I mean, it wasn't like you know the you know the 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 Russian missiles were going to be lobbed, you know, to European American cities. Um, but the fact that that Putin was taking it out of the storage, and he was like, you know. I'm not afraid of using it if I have to. Yeah. Um and then for, for a lot of not just for me, but I think for a lot of people, I mean, um, it was a deep shock. I mean, it was like holy shit. I mean, because again, you know, we're talking very old technology, 1945. You know, it's been up and down, the Cuban missile crisis very high, and then it went down again. Uh, collapse of Soviet Union. It was like, oh, great relief, and now all of a sudden it's roaring up. Yeah, it it kind of reminds me of classic C. Wright Mills, the causes of World War Three. World War Three. Uh, what would be the causes ultimately? You know, like nowadays, people. I don't know if they think if Russia, Putin will do it. If he will be the cause. Um, but there sure was a lot of worry <laughs> that, uh, you know, it, it's not over yet. You know, I mean, there's this whole tank business now. Uh, but uh, I'm curious, what will be the causes of World War Three? you know, to to uh, go back to that book by C. Wright Mills? <laughs> what will, will, will it be? Will it be uh, accidental, you know? Oops, you know, there's some technology that failed and then it, they do launch it by accident. So, so C. Wright Mills, he... <laughs> Global warming, uh, the you know, planetary something where they shoot missiles down from, you know, uh, moon or something. Yeah, this be, is purely yeah. sci-fi now. You know, is, we're just speculating. Well, C. Wright Mills. I mean, he died in nineteen sixty-two. Yeah. I think so. He died yeah. right before the Cuban Missile Crisis. Or yeah, I was or... the sixties, thinking uh, that he the the causes of the World War Three. And I don't remember the whole thesis, but it was. It was know, maybe it was in response to the missile crisis. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was written within a Cold War context. We can I can say that much, but uh, it's a good question to ask. You know, if you're trying to think of, you know, possibility of future studies. You know, uh, that's a field. Uh, what would be the scenarios? What we can predict. Uh, Causes likely causes of World War Three. Will it be a new kind of terrorism? Will it be cyber warfare? Will it be exactly this tension between uh, declining superpowers, you know, or uh, one superpower uh, versus you know the Russia, or will it be EU? We don't know. Or China, you know. I mean, we don't know. It'd be difficult to know. Yeah, so the the the, the two the two big um, elephants you could say in the room were China and Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, so with Russia, you could say, okay, well, they're right now in a hot war indirectly with NATO, right? I mean, you just mentioned the tank deliveries. I mean, they just Leopold, Leopold, and uh, yeah, the Leopold, Leopold, and... yeah. I mean, and they, they, uh, Abram tanks and the Abrams tanks, and the Abrams tanks, um. And I would say that probably within a month or two, I think the discussion about the fighter jets will come up. Um, because if you remember at the beginning of the conflict, right? So last year in February, 
And then in March, you know, the the Western Alliance was talking about, you know, um, the Javelin missiles, right? Everything was about the the Enlaw, the Javelin, and the Stinger, right? Mm -hmm. Which are all the handheld weapons uh, that... But, but, but basically, the, the CIA intelligence agency calculation was that Russia was going to take over Kiev was going to topple the government uh, and then there was going to be an insurgency where basically so instead of like a regular Ukrainian army um, which would be disarmed by by Russia uh, you would have like a partisan army uh, like, like militia that would you know make needle prick attacks against the Russian occupation army and they need stingers. They need, um, you know, man pads and so forth. So that was the original calculation. That's why they. That's why they said we're only going to give them those weapon systems. Uh, but then they. Then the West saw. Okay, well, okay. The Ukrainians are fighting well. They keep fighting, and then they kept on increasing the weapon supplies. Um, where it, yeah, it took them eleven months to then say, well, okay, okay, we're going to give them the tanks now. So. And so now, right now, the momentum is building really to throw in everything. I mean, it's like, I mean, the the the, the two things. So short of nuclear weapons, I mean, there's two things that the West didn't give, which is the the fighter jets and the long range missiles. Yeah. So, so initially, so it was the the short medium range missile, which was the the high Mars that was delivered last summer. That was made a big difference. Uh, now there is um, another thing with like five letter acronym which is like 150 kilometers which is twice the length of the high Mars uh, now that's going to be delivered um, you know attackums would be the 300 kilometers that would be the that would be the next possible um you know, missile system. Um, so, so the weapon support is definitely increasing. Um, the, the longer that Ukraine fights, I mean, it's pretty clear. Now, in terms of a direct threat to its World War Three from that particular conflict, mm. I would say that chance is still very low, because remember, so whenever. The West announced a new weapon system delivered to Ukraine. You know, Putin says we're going to retaliate. You know, we're going to attack the shipments, the convoys, right? That bring those weapons in. Um, you know, uh, like the, the the weapons are not even going to reach the front line, right? Which it it, it clearly was rhetoric, right? Because there was nothing. Uh, that they did, which would have interdicted those foes. Um, the so short of the nuclear weapons, I mean, I think that Russia has used all of the escalation that they could have undertaken. So, for instance, like the the most barbaric weapons they're using is the th thermobaric weapons, which means. It's kind of like cluster ammunition, right? You throw it into a location and then it explodes midair and then it spreads out, right? It's not just one location, but it's like it's the entire area is getting bombarded. Um, but they're already using that in the front line. Then you're know, attacking civilian infrastructure. Well, they have done that mm -hmm. since October. Electric, um, right? For Power grid or something? Yeah, attacking the power grid. Um, so they they're basically doing everything that they have in their arsenal. Um, they did the full blocking of the you know pipeline gas, right? Um, well, the oil supplies, the oil supplies is rough because because you can easily replace the the oil shipments. Um, because it's delivered via tankers. Um, 
but the gas is like it's a little bit less flexible but but the Germans cut out the Russian gas in August completely I mean there's been no Russian gas since then um so so that that card has been played so it's the the last card he's playing now is is a mobilization. So if if he announced a new round of mobilization, like a big one, so because right now he says, okay, I have officially three hundred thousand men. First wave mobilization was back in September. The Western intelligence services say it's actually two hundred two hundred fifty. Okay. Um, out of that, maybe half of them have been deployed already. So about a hundred k to the to the front. So that leaves about say 150k for uh that that he holds in reserve and that he will throw in for a second round of attack. Now, but you also have to consider that so the original invasion army was also about 150,000. But those were the original troops in the Russian army. Right, um, which means you know the best trained, you know the ones who already had combat experience and everything, right? So now everybody that he's sending into the second wave attack, yeah, is going to be mobilized. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, there's some training, but it's going to be minimal training, right? Yeah. Um, so. These so, were probably draftees, right? They were involuntarily <laughs> drafted. Yeah, the, I the guess. mobilized are draftees, yes. Um, yeah. And so the only way how he can top it is he does a second round of mobilization with at least the same number of troops, if not more. I mean, maybe he has to shoot now for actually 300,000. Um, and then he throws them in all at once um, in, in human wave attacks which is how like so there was some city Solidar in the east of Ukraine um, fell because of the human wave attacks and then now, now they're trying that in the southern front as well so um, it, it's it looks like a last ditch effort to me right yeah, me too. Um, because I mean, because it, it, it's it's because I mean, how likely is it that he holds a lot of equipment, so tanks and so forth, artillery in reserve, so that he can? But then, why would he waste the first round soldiers in the human wave attacks? Yeah, I think the human waves are happening because that's that's all he has left. So where you could try again one huge wave of mobilization, you know, and then throw them to the front all at once. Um, and I, but but then it, it it's still I mean, you see the the issue is like so in terms of the original war goal, right, which is to capture Kiev, to capture the capital city. It's not going to be enough, right? <laughs> Um, what they're doing. So, anyway, it doesn't look good. Uh, but, um, Putin is not in a position to to fight with NATO directly. I mean, if you look at the uh, troops around Saint Petersburg, for instance, which are it's closer to the to the Finnish border. Right, which is, I guess, it's going to be NATO country and also like Estonia, right? Those garrisons, they have left. And they're all fighting in Ukraine. Uh, so there is no capacity for the Russians at the moment to have a direct confrontation with NATO. Or with Finland, yeah. <laughs> yeah, with Finland, yeah. Um, so, so that's why I, so my guess is, so is that the threat of World War Three, specifically from the Ukraine war is, 
low. Um, yeah, the, the 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 threat would have to come if 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 Ukraine was to fall, and then Russia is able to rebuild, and then and then you know they they think about furthering their expansion. I think then then there could be a risk for that. So I think in terms of the, ge the geopolitical threat that I is this is the current assessment. I mean, I'm not sure if there's some wild card event that will change the calculus in a few months. Um, but I, I, I do think that the, that the China-Taiwan confrontations that, that, that would be that would be a big a big shock. Because the U.S. will be tested in its direct resolve uh, in the sense that the level of protection that the Americans had promised to the Taiwanese is much more than what they promised to the Ukrainians. Yeah. And that is and that is the fear because now if we have US China, these are the two biggest economies in the world, the two biggest military spenders in the world. And they're two of the big nuclear powers in the world. Yeah. So um, if there was a direct confrontation um, on the Taiwan Strait, uh, or three, huh? <laughs> then I then I think I would be much more concerned. I'd okay. be much more concerned about that, and that's why I was hoping absolutely that. Right now, there's speculation about whether. Xi Jinping is not as powerful as you know as, as he was uh, Patel a few months ago um because of the zero covid fiasco and apparently on some other policies he's also been dialing back now so for instance uh, there was this idea of the technology crackdown right so basically the party was afraid that the tech companies were getting too independent from uh from Beijing. Uh and then it's like, well, okay, we're gonna impose a fine on you for violating this law and so forth, right? Um, which of course, I mean it's not a real rule of law country, right? It's basically like if if the government wants to punish you, you know, they will find a reason mm -hmm. to do that, right? I mean it's it's not. It's not. It's not a rule of law, right? Power. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's. It's like. I mean. It's, it's quite interesting. I mean, a lot of like prominent people, like VIPs, that are all of a sudden they're facing tax fraud charges, which are probably real. I mean, like you know, they they, they probably did you know underpay taxes, but but a lot of people do. I mean, and and, and they seem to only want to punish you. If they wanted to make, you know, an example out of you, right? Um. Anyway. Uh. So, so they they've been dialing back the technology crackdowns now. Now the next thing is like, okay, so originally Xi Jinping said, okay, we're gonna control the property bubble, which basically means you restrict the issuing, uh, new loans, you know, uh, new mortgages. Uh, the on the risky uh, loan conditions. Uh, now, now that's apparently also been dialed back. Now, as like, can now, it's like okay, we want the property market to grow because we know that's a source of economic growth. Um, and now it's a big question because uh, how, like like how comparable is it to to the Mao era, right? Because and the Mao Zedong, I mean, in, you know, in in the fifties, he did the Great Leap Forward. That was his big project, right? We do quick industrialization. We're going to, you know, uh, take agricultural crops, export it overseas, make the money, buy equipment, and then reindustrialize, right? Uh, and then, by the way, there was a famine, and then millions of people starved. Yeah. Uh, you know, grain imports were refused, etc. Right? Forget um, the Cultural Revolution, right? <laughs> yeah, 
Now that, yeah. that that's the key, right? So then Mao stepped back and he let the reformers take take over, Deng Xiaoping, Liu Xiaoqi. Uh he then let them go on for a couple of years to restore the economy, and they did. And then when the economy was on the mend, that's when Mao Zedong turned around and said, Okay, we're gonna have cultural revolution. Because he was afraid that the country was gonna become capitalist all of a sudden. Which I think there's some truth to that. But I think his main worry was that he was losing power, right? Because I mean, a, a big part of what the Red Guards were doing is they they were beating up the intellectuals and, like, you could say the the, the centrists, you know, the reformers, right? Um, the people who wanted the economy to get better, right? Um, Right, so th- th- those were the declared enemies, right? Uh, and then you replaced them with with political hacks, right? Uh, the, the cultural revolution, and so I, I, see, it's a big question. I mean, of course, nobody has the answer for that yet because we haven't seen the outcome of it. Yeah, we haven't. Yeah, yeah, but is you know is, is Xi Jinping just leaning back? Then he's gonna come in later, right? Um, you know, like just like Mao did. I mean, or you know, or is he permanently weakened, and then eventually he'll be replaced by somebody else? You know, so um, no trajectory, right? Yeah, and no. then the big question is like, is Xi Jinping's way of comeback? Um taking the form of the Taiwan war. Right. Uh, it's that, that 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 that's that's the thing that that's the key factor that is unknown and it is quite scary. I mean uh, are there any signs of it at all? I mean like would would that the state even uh mention it? Would it be kind of secretive? Would it be uh a public matter in in China. I'm curious. I mean, would it be all secret and like what the plans are? Are they hinting at? I mean, nobody knows. I mean, I would think that would be very secretive. You know, <laughs> if I was the state. Yeah, you know, I mean, one thing that was so secret. interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. Was that the the co- the cover um, the Russian cover for the Ukraine attack? Uh-huh was blown uh i think it was in the fall of uh 21 so the, the troop oh, really? build-up started um in the spring of 21 uh so it was you could you kind of guess what was going to happen um but, but but then even at that point you could have said okay it's just you know he's just trying to make some geopolitical points or whatever he's not going to attack it's intelligence services right that usually kind of figure it out and they have that they make and then they can say that's likely what's going to happen that they can say have a kind of game theory or something or a game no analysis. i don't think it was game theory i, th- I think yeah. what happened is that yeah. now of course i'm not a secret service yeah. insider yeah. uh I'm not either. Service insider. <laughs> but my guess of what happened is that there's some russian bureaucrats within the kremlin like a high level one who is a mole right Oh, like like he 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 would be divulging the secret to the U.S. intelligence service. That that that's I mean that's one way. I mean the other way to get the information is by um, decrypting the you know Kremlin servers, right? Like the yeah. internal communication, effectively. Um. Yeah, but either either way, I mean it's the the West did get the information. And so that's why when the actual invasion happened, people are like shocked, but they were not surprised, right? That's key, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you think about like the Nassim Taleb argument, like the, the black swan event, right? Like a, you have a gray swan and a black swan, right? The black swan is is an unknown, unknown, and then uh, and then the gray swan is like a known unknown. So, so, so in this case, it was a known unknown, right? Because uh, intelligence services were divulging it. Um, with China, we don't have indications 
for that uh, for that invasion yeah. being imminent. I, I saw the interview by uh, Joseph Wu, the foreign minister of uh, Taiwan, uh, and he suggested that it's going to happen in twenty twenty seven. When uh, when Xi Jinping is going to get another reappointment uh, yeah. to the fourth term, where he's going to presumably be so old that you know he he wants to do it now, right? He wants to finish up the business in his lifetime, so to speak. Um, and that is that that, that is that is a real possibility i mean um I, I but i but i hope that it is not happening i mean uh of course we don't want I, war <laughs> nobody wants war yeah that's right i mean uh, um yeah i mean all, all i would say to you know taiwanese friends is that you know um if we can get out of there um not before 2027. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, or any anytime soon. I mean, if you have like any kind of escape option, I mean, that's also one of the things where, like, you you kind of don't know. I mean, like, if you remember the the car columns um, on the 24th of February out of Kiev, right? And and, and all and you see all the cars are like moving in one direction, right? Like the to to the to the towards the west to the Polish border, right? And then and then if you look at the other side, like the west to east highway was completely empty, right? Uh, and um, uh, yeah, I remember seeing it on TV. I was watching a lot of European uh, uh, television when that happened, and the influx of uh, refugees towards the Polish border it was actually very interesting to watch. Uh, the trains that were just uh, used to transport everyone uh, either to uh, other Polish cities or German cities or as far as Sweden is surprising. And there was uh, Ukrainian refugees that arrived all over Europe. As far as I know, I think everybody uh, accepted Ukrainian refugees. Yeah, I mean, but the thing that struck me the most, I mean, the fact that like women, children, I mean, they escaped the war. I mean, I think it's obvious why it's happening. But I think the one the, the the thing that struck me was the opposite movement when the Ukrainian men that were mostly men, uh, some women, but mostly men, uh, that were working in in Europe, right? But they returned to Ukraine um, because at that point, you know, when martial law was declared, the men were not allowed to leave the country. Now, if you were already living in the West, you know, and if you're like, oh, you know screw war right i don't want to fight a war i mean you could have stayed in the west right but there were like a couple tens of thousands of ukrainian men that were um they were going the other way right they were going into ukraine yeah um and they were just and then and then they were stopped by the journalists in the border region they were like why are you going and it's like well uh, it's yeah, flat market Fight for my country, yeah. Defend the homeland, yeah, exactly. And, um, yeah, so that that that, that was that, that was deeply impressive because, you know, it, it's see, I, I see, I have this dispute with a, with a, with a friend of mine who was like, he was pro Afghanistan war, and against helping ukraine which is quite it's it's quite an interesting position um and f and for me it's the opposite right so i'm against afghanistan war i'm for ukraine and uh so it's it's beyond just like like u.s geopolitical interest right i think because because you know defining what is u.s geopolitical interest i think there's a lot of disagreement for sure about that idea but you see, the 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 Afghan government is extraordinarily corrupt. I mean, it was so corrupt that the the leadership that so they they received the aid money from from the West, mostly from America, to mm -hmm. you know pay the salaries of the soldiers, and 
most of it is would end up in the pockets of the leadership. You know, both like the generals and then the you know the government um, itself. And it was not surprising that they didn't want to fight the Afghan soldiers. So because so because the Americans were leaving, the Taliban wherever the Americans were leaving, the Taliban was coming in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, presumably, the Afghan army would stand in the way to to keep out the the Taliban, but they didn't do it. Yeah. So th that's why the collapse was so quick. I mean, it's. It's like Saigon of 1975, right? It happened really quick, yeah. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, and um, versus, I mean, in Ukraine, it was the opposite, right? It's like the, 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 the U.S. was like saying to Zelensky, we're going to get you out of the country, right? Um, like you can have like, you can be like, um, who is it, French... President uh, during World War Two, uh, mm -hmm. the general, the De Gaulle, De Gaulle, right? You could be like General De Gaulle, right? You 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 lead like a a government in exile uh, against the Russian occupation, you know that that sort of idea. Um, and and Zelensky was, you know, give me ammo, you know, not a right, uh, and yeah, w w once that thing was sort of. Once that became clear, then um, yeah, it, then then it made sense to support the country because you know that they wanted to fight. Um, and now it's very interesting because there's a dispute about Ukrainian corruption, right? About laying off some of the um, high level ministers, um, and and I see why Zelensky is doing it because. Because the West is like, okay, well, we're giving you the money and the weapons, but are you going to actually use it properly, right? Or is it going to... And not cash it in or take cash it, it in. Um, <laughs> and, There's a worry uh, about that, you know? I mean, it's, it's highly valuable tanks. Uh, I'm sure it's not going to happen, but I can imagine if there'll be some motive or interest, you know, <laughs> you could, technically. Once well, you there was it. siphoning. There was siphoning yeah. in, the, in the military leadership, so to sack the deputy defense minister who was in charge of the logistics, which means um, supplying the soldiers in the front line with you know food and water and everything. Um, and basically, the ministry overpaid for the food. Mm. Right? So, let's say, I don't know, it costs, you know, $1 a meal, right? And then, but then on the, um, on, on the calculation, you say it costs $2. Okay, so where did that extra dollar go, right? Well, they basically pocketed, right? Um, so, uh, so, so, so that guy was fired, uh, and I think it's it's a good direction which the country is moving because, yeah, um, because if you fire the bad apples, then the people who stay they're like, oh shoot, I, I have to be careful, right? I cannot be corrupt. Yeah. Um, so that that, that that's a, that's a good sign, um. All right. Yeah, and also during a war, right? You don't. I mean, it, it just doesn't look good, right? I mean, if you, like, if 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 your you know if countrymen are dying and then you're making a buck. <laughs> yeah, and you're making a buck, right? Like, yeah. Okay. I, I wonder think... if transparent uh, transparency international has uh, any ranking on Ukraine before the Ukrainian war. I'm curious. I know Russia is pretty high too, but I know. Uh, Nigeria was the highest country, I believe. Uh, but I believe, uh, that might be interesting. How, what, what, it, what corruption levels existed before the war? Uh, I might look that up if I have a chance. Yeah, I don't have yeah. the numbers in my head, but I, but I do know that b both Russia and Ukraine are corrupt countries. Uh, Russia more corrupt than Ukraine. Um, but, I mean, it's like GDP... In Russia per, per capita, right? Not just total, because obviously total is going to be higher in Russia because of the population. But, uh, but also per capita, the GDP is higher in Russia, um, because you know Russia has the hydrocarbons, like they export gas and oil and stuff. Um, and Ukraine is 
quite was has been quite corrupt, uh, also poorer than, than Russia. Um, but the, the, but the quality of institutions was was somewhat better, right? Like for instance, like the the democratic elections, like ever since the Maidan protest, particularly in twenty fourteen, and then also the revolution, uh, the Orange Revolution two thousand four, um, the, the 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 institutions, uh, democratic system, has gotten better over time in Ukraine. Um, which is the reason why, like, you could elect a comedian as a president, right? Mm. I mean, it was an outsider. I mean, because normally you would be like, well, okay, you know, uh, like you wouldn't put an outsider in charge of the country. Um, but there's still a lot of things going wrong, obviously. Yeah, I mean, there's corruption at different levels. Um, but it's 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 less of a problem now for Ukraine than it's for Russia. Because... Because because uh, um, because it's a war of defense, so so the Ukrainians they feel very righteous about that struggle, so they're gonna look down on anything that's gonna take away from that struggle. Um, for the Russian side, it's not obvious because there's a lot of men that fled mobilization. Um, there are some people, not many, that protested the war. Um, you know. People are not very enthusiastic about the war, but they don't want to speak out against it, right? Because if you're being targeted by the police. I mean, in Russia, right? In Russia, yeah. Yeah. Did you know that uh, on Marcus uh, Lan's uh, show, uh, this happened uh, this Tuesday, uh, uh, there was an invitation of like a to, Russian descendant. To Russian activist. Yeah, I watched that. I watched oh, that. you watched that one? Yeah. And he was uh, analyzing the propaganda strategy that has been really, you know, uh, occurred in Russia. And this uh, just, I mean, pure propaganda in the media there. Apparently, you know, anybody that is a descendant or opposed gets, you know, beat up. So uh, really serious. Well, his allegations, I mean, they they're, they were actually taking segments from Russian television and like the kind of speech or discourse that occurs uh, and the, 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 the propaganda that's just used, you know, to connect, you know, even with uh, Olaf Scholz uh, sending tanks, this was framed as, as Nazis or sending, you know, tanks to, to fight Russia, like a cold war two narrative, uh, excuse me, world, world war two. Yeah. World war two narrative. And this, uh, yeah, uh, apparently it's, you know, it's propaganda, pure, you know. Yeah, and, and, and that same expert, uh, the same dissident was pointing out that um, even if people are against the war, they're not able to speak out against it. So, yeah. the, so in an authoritarian country, right, like if you really fear the repression of the rulers of the police, the best way for you to survive is, like, if you're asked in the survey about the war, is to say, "I support the war." Um, but then, of course, in your heart, you don't support the war, right? Like you think it's terrible that. Like your country is basically slaughtering like your neighbor, right? Um, and also, there's a lot of Russians who have relatives in Ukraine, uh, and they're like, "Well, okay, well, you know, you don't want your relatives and friends to die, right?" Um, so there's that. I mean, um, a dislike generally of the war, but you can't really express it, right? Yeah. Um. So that's why the thing that's going to bring the war to an end, I think, um, it would have to be so within the nomenclature, so within the Kremlin leadership, not Putin himself, because I don't think he's reformable, but but certainly but the people around him, 
like once they start sort of realizing okay the yeah like cost benefit right so the cost of sustaining putin in power you know which means the continuation of the war is is higher than than the benefits of of having him right mm -hmm. and then when that flips around and they can agree on the person that will take over then or some transition yeah you don't think they'll assassinate him though, do you <laughs> it's no, it's possible it's possible yeah, sure. two or something yeah yeah, yeah. And, and then there, there's an, there's another speculation about like what the escape options are i mean like could putin get asylum in you know venezuela or North Iran? Korea or something no. like that. Um, yeah. And Belarus. Yeah. So if if he was to request, well, Belarus would be a little bit too close to Europe, I think. Um, yeah. And Be Belarus regime is also not stable because 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 if Russia kind of collapses, then Belarus collapses. Eh? Well, Lukashenko. Specifically, yeah. that that guy. I mean, the Lukashenko regime. I mean, and... they're buddies. I think they're buddies. They uh, think alike. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So yeah. it might not be the best place to hide in Belarus. Um. But. Yeah. But okay. So if if Putin was, requ I mean, I don't think it's going to happen because I think. You know he's. He he's like Hitler. I mean, there's, there's there's like this bunker mentality, right? It's like yeah, like you remember the the the, the scene where where the gen where the Nazi generals were like, you know, we can get you to to back this garden, right? Which is the in in, in the Bavaria. Talk about the downfall, the movie, the downfall, the, the downfall. The that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good book. Yeah, we, we 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 drag you out to back this garden in 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 Bavaria, and then you can keep fighting, right? There you go. No. Uh, uh, and he's like, no, 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 I'm going to stay in Berlin, um, and yeah, so it's 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 like it's, it's, it's kind of, it, it it feels like a little bit like that. I think, I I, I think I think Putin will want to stick it out to the end. Um, yeah. So the only thing that that could change the calculus is if he was forced from power, basically, uh, which. Is scary because I mean we because we don't we don't know when it's gonna happen how it's gonna happen we don't know what's gonna happen the day after he gets toppled. Um, do we have a more responsible leadership, uh, or do we have somebody who's even more reckless, who's gonna t actually take out the nukes? You know, so. Uh, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, risks. <laughs> it's 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 a risk. So you know, the yeah. Ukraine was a risk. Uh, the Taiwan situation could be a risk. Um, Chat GPT, you know, is immediately could be a risk for us. You know, it, we, we'll see. We'll see in the next couple of years, like what the what the hiring perspective is for for faculty. You know, <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, All right. uh, yeah. Okay. So we'll call the podcast an end. Uh, so. Okay. Uh, so thank good. you. Uh, very much for joining me here, Mike. No problem. <laughs> yeah.